What's up, everybody? Welcome into the Next Pats podcast. We have a very special treat for you today. We have Dante Scarnecchia, former Patriots offensive line coach. To me, a Hall of Fame assistant coach. I hope he ends up in Canton someday. We know there aren't that many assistants in Canton, but if anybody is deserving, it is this guy. And we were lucky enough to get him onto the podcast for almost 30 minutes to talk all things Patriots. What did he think of that three pass 46 run performance from the Patriots offense on Monday night and a win over the bills? What kind of lift does that performance give a team, not only along the offensive line, but on the sideline and among the coaching staff as well, you know, we had to bring up Mac Jones and how the Patriots are bringing him along. Dante Skarnicki shares his thoughts there and then we break down a little bit of film as well that's going to be something for our youtube viewers so if you're listening to the audio version of this because it didn't make a lot of sense in all likelihood without the pictures to go with it we've cut that part from the audio version here and we've left it in on the youtube version so it'll sound seamless when you're listening to the audio version here but just know if you go over and you look at this podcast with dante scarnacchia on next pats search that Google on YouTube itself, it'll come up. You can find some great looks from the end zone from that Monday night football broadcast on two staple plays from the Patriots offensive attack on Monday. One is a staple for the Patriots and has been for some time now. It's crack toss. We hear Dante Skarnacchia break that down. What are the key elements to that play? What allowed that play to work? What allowed Damian Harris to scoot in for a 64 yard touchdown on that play? We're also going to hear him talk about another play that the Patriots used over and over and over again, it is commonly referred to as G lead, but you're going to hear Dante Skarnacki give the play call as far as he understands it in this Patriot system and where the key elements of that play are, how that play works. It's one that I think we're going to see again and again and again moving forward, even though before that Monday night game, we didn't see it all that much. So you get some film breakdowns from Dante Skarnacki. You get some opinion on how the Patriots are bringing along Mac Jones. We're also going to talk about Handling success, Dante Skarnecchia, obviously, has been a part of some really, really successful football teams. How do they keep their nose to the grindstone? How do they keep that quote-unquote two-and-four mentality, which this year's team is trying to maintain, even when everybody's picking them as one of the best teams in the conference? They're already the number one seed in the AFC. They're already the number one team in the AFC East. How do they keep that going? How do they keep that edge? Great insight from Dante Skarnecchia there as well. All right, let's get right to our interview with Dante Skarnecchia and... His new puppy, his new puppy? That's right, Dante Skarnecchia and his new puppy. Hit it. All right, very happy to have with us now the great Dante Skarnecchia. Dante, thanks for spending some time with us here. Thanks a lot, Phil, and I'm not great, so let's go on. (laughs) Well, our listeners know that that's not the case. You got a lot of big fans uh, in our listenership, I know. And one of the first things we just, spoke very briefly before we started here, but I'm sure there are people out there that are wondering what it was like for Dante Skarnecchia, just a couple days removed from that Monday night game where the Patriots throw it just three times and they have all kinds of success running the football. What it was like for you, offensive line coach Dante Skarnecchia, to watch that kind of performance? I, th- You know, I think like everyone, you know, it was, it was amazing in a lot of respects to think you're only going to go and throw the ball three times in a whole game. I think it's pretty much every offensive lineman's dream just to be able to run off the ball almost every snap 96% of the time and go hit someone and not have to worry about edge rushers and twist stunts inside and pass protection. And it just makes the game a lot easier. And, and, you know, I know, I know that that's what those guys like to do the most is come off the ball and hit people. I can't remember a game, maybe outside of a Super Bowl. I can't remember a game where David Andrews was as visibly pleased as he was after that one. And he said something to the effect of kind of glad we didn't call any pass plays late in that game because it had been a while since I had taken a pass set. What is it like for, for the players we we've heard from Dante, right? Where, you know, if you can run the ball that way and you can really kind of impose your will, you get an emotional lift from that. What is it like being on the sidelines? And I know, you know, you didn't coach in a game like that one for the Patriots where you only throw it three times, but when you can do that, whenever you want to seemingly, what kind of emotional lift does that give to a team and to a sideline? I think it gives a huge lift to everyone. You know, the defense is over there and 
you know, even though there weren't, a, it was an amazing game in a lot of respects. 11 first downs, you don't think that that's a lot. And I'm sure, I don't know what the time of possession was, but it was, it's one of those games where everyone shares in it. You know, the defensive guys are sitting on the bench and they're happy to, to say, okay, keep, hold on to the ball, hold on to the ball, let's keep these guys off the field. And, you know, the, the guys that aren't involved in defense and watching the offense, they're, they're standing there saying, this is great. And I just, everybody takes pleasure in it. I know as a line coach, you sit there and you watch it and say, oh man, let's keep going, you know, keep going. And uh, I, you're right, Bill, I've not been in many of those games. We played in some tough games in Buffalo uh, relative to the weather where we were really one-handed running the ball quite a bit, but not to those extremes. So that was something. You mentioned the time of possession. It was about a five minute advantage, four minute advantage for the, for the Patriots, uh, 32 to, to 28 is basically yeah. what it was. So yeah, it's always good. That's what you're, that's what you're looking for. I wonder too, you know, what your, your thoughts are Dante, just in terms of how the team is built, because there aren't that many teams that are constructed in a way where they could take advantage of those kinds of conditions, or they could play in a game that way where you're bringing an extra offensive lineman onto the field for over 60% of the snaps and you're just running, running and running again. When you look at how this team is constructed, is it a little bit, it, it's almost anachronistic. It's almost, you know, a, a blast from the past in some ways. Do, do you look at it that way that they are so run heavy? Um, they have these big offensive linemen when a lot of lines across the league have gotten a little bit lighter, I think, to maybe get a little bit more athletic. How do you view how this team has been constructed over the last couple of years to be able to play a game like that one? Uh, you know, I, I think that if you have the ability to run the ball consistently well, which they do, and they have done it for two years that way. Last year, they were fifth in the league in rushing. And this year, you know, they were maybe just a few weeks ago, they were like 15th, they're probably in the top 10 now. And so, you know, I think that's that's just part of the whole picture. You know, they also threw the ball 50 times a couple of weeks ago. So right. when you have balance in your offense, Phil, which clearly they have balance, they're not a one sided team you know i you know they can throw it effectively and they can run it effectively and i think when you have that ability to do both which they do i think it just makes you it makes it really hard for the other guys and, and especially the other night where you know it was really almost impossible to throw the ball the other night you know and, uh, and they were able to rely on a run game that uh, was really superior to the guys they were playing when you were towards, you know, your, I don't know, last five or six years, probably here, Dante, the, the passing game has just exploded and it feels like it's gone up every, every year in terms of, you know, the number of explosive plays, the number of pass yards, the number of points, you know, we've seen some records being set here in the last five or six years, but did you all as a staff ever view it as, okay, this is what the modern game is now because of the rules because of the people that are coming into the game and, and the people that we have to pick from. And so we have to adapt to that. Or was there always this sense that it doesn't have to be that way. We can go a different way when the rest of the league is getting lighter and getting smaller, because it, it does feel like there has been this, this zig here in new England and maybe a couple other teams when the rest of the league has zagged to get more explosive. You know, I, I know that we always, from a philosophical standpoint, as an offensive staff, we always used to say, look, if we can run the ball 24 times or more in a game, that we felt we had a really good chance to win the game because we were a balanced offensive football team. So that to us was very, very important. And, uh, and we strive for that all the time. Yes, there are games where you get a little bit more one-sided than the other, but I just, we, you know, collectively as an offensive staff, and I know Josh feels this way, and, and I haven't talked to Josh in a long time, uh, is that, you know, if, you're, if you have a run game and you have a run action game where you're showing the same runs and throwing the ball off those runs, you're going to make life miserable for a lot of people. So we thought that was all really good. How do you feel – about the way that the Patriots have handled Mac Jones, Dante. Obviously, he's a young guy. He hasn't seen a lot. I think there has been 
over the course of the season, not just Monday where he obviously he only throws it three times, but I think at the end of the Bucks game, there have been a handful of other instances where people have looked at it and said, should he have even more on his plate than what he's getting already? How do you view the way that the Patriots have handled him in his first season? I think they've done a magnificent job of bringing this kid along. I think that number one, of, of all the quarterbacks in the draft, and I'm not saying this guy's this or this guy's that, and this guy's not this, not this guy's not that, but this guy was a perfect system fit for them, a perfect system fit. They take 15 choice in the draft, and and then and then to bring them along the way that they brought them along, I think they've done a superior job of coaching this guy. And I would say this to you, and I don't think it's a secret to anyone, but when you when you watch the Patriot games. And after every offensive series, they go to the bench. Tell me what you see. When you watch it on TV, tell me what you see on the sideline. Yeah, they go to the bench, and it's Josh and Mac right there on the bench immediately when he gets to the sideline, right? Exactly. Immediately, immediately. The guy calling the plays is sitting next to the guy who on the field is calling the plays and has the toughest job in all of sports. And they spend a tremendous amount of time together – when, when he's not on the field, they spend all their time together. I think, I think Josh has done a magnificent job with them. And I think to Mac, Max credit, he's embraced it. He's a cerebral guy. He's not emotionally way too high, way too low guy. And I think that the key to the success has been, the, you know, the, I'll use the term marriage between those two guys and the integration of those two guys on the sideline. I think they've done a tremendous job. Sorry, we've got a, a puppy who is going to drive me crazy. So I had to put him outside. That's great. That's okay. Is it? A, it's a new. It's new to the family. Ah, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, I thought we were done with dogs. <laughs> I'm 73 years old. I told them all. I said we're not having another dog. Guess what? And, there and, she is. Look right? at me right in the face right now. Yep. And and who's taking care of her? The, the oh, guy of course taking, I am. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's how it works. Yeah, right. I, trust me. Well, we're, we are, uh, we've got a young family at home and we've, we have a four-year-old who is dying for a dog. So, okay. Yeah, well. Hey, all right. But you got to help out. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can help. I can help. Good luck. I know. I know how this is going to go. Yeah. I know how this is going to go. Uh, when it comes to the offensive line and Mac, Dante, that's an interesting marriage that, um, you know, for me, and I think for a lot of others, because one of the reasons Mac, I think, fell the way he did in the draft is because he's perceived to be not an athletic guy. And, and a lot of teams want that at that position. But for an offensive line, what kind of advantage does it give them when they know they're pass protecting for a quote unquote pocket passer? Because I've heard from offensive linemen before that when you have a quarterback who's more prone to scrambling around, that can actually make the offensive line's job tougher can you speak to that just the importance of of understanding where the quarterback is is going to be on some of those pass plays for for the offensive line well i i think not unlike tom you know mac is he's going back to a certain point in the pocket and they're not going to bootleg a lot with him out of that pocket and he's going to stand there he's going to work the pocket he's going to step forward he's going to step into those areas that are voided by the way people pass rush and more importantly than anything, Bill, he's going to get the ball out in rhythm. And I think that's the one quality that gets lost in this whole thing is that, you know, how, how fast, how well does a guy take his steps, get back to where his uh, drop point is, step up into the pocket, get the ball out in rhythm. Those are the guys that the offensive linemen appreciate the most, you know, get the ball out on time and, and usually if they set right and they get their hands on those guys talking about the offensive linemen or the defensive linemen, you know, and the ball comes out in time, then that's a long, hard time for the rushers. They, you know, they rush, they give all that effort and the ball's gone and they got to turn and chase the ball. And they hate doing that. But so, you know, to that point, I think that that's what causes linemen to have a great appreciation for the guy that's playing behind them is the guy that gets the ball out in rhythm. Hey, look, there's a lot of those guys that can run around and do all that stuff, but you know, they all, most of them start by going straight back and then working the pocket and throwing the ball. Then there's other guys, you know, that can get out of there and make plays down the field. Well, Mac's not going to do that. Tommy couldn't do that, but 
you know, that's not a liability either. You know, so if they only run for three or four yards, those are th those are yards forward and not yards behind the line of scrimmage. So I, I think they all I think we all have a great appreciation for Mac and the job he's done and and especially for those coaches and the job that they've done with him. When you guys are looking for certain qualities in your offensive linemen, you used to say smart, tough, and athletic enough. Yep. How would you describe the group that you're watching this year? I think they're all that, you know. They, every one of them, they, they understand the game. They, they don't make many mental errors. Um, it's, you know, you, you made the point that the biggest line in the league, I, or one of the bigger lines, I don't think they are at all. You know, David Andrews weighs 290. Right. Ted, Ted weighs about 300. Shaq weighs about 305. Isaiah's not a big tackle. The biggest guy he got is Trent. I mean, he's a, and he's a giant. That's where the average goes way up. You put it, right. you put 15 more pounds on everybody when you weigh him. Right. So right. to keep it real, four of those five guys are just average size guys. And but they're bulldogs, man. And I don't mean that University of Georgia bulldogs. Like you got, got a couple of those. Say. But they're tough guys and they and they are smart and they are athletic enough. And and they can do those things, and they're system guys for the Patriots. So credit to all of them, man. They've done, they've just done a great job, and and the, and and Carm's done a great job of coaching them, as did Cole did the year before. I think it's tougher to prepare for for an offense like New England's Dante. When we've seen so much wide zone, right, like this Shanahan style running game. I think it's how a lot of people would reference it, um, and that makes sense because there have been a lot of guys that have that kind of background that have gone on to become play callers across the league. But does that make it a little bit more difficult to prepare for the Patriots where, you know, you've got these pulling guards and you've got these tackles that are leading out into the flat and blocking corners. And you've got a fullback who weighs 255 pounds who plays a lot. You know, is there something about this running game that is, that is maybe hard to prepare for just because it's not all that widespread across the league? I think you're right. The two back runs aren't widespread. But I also think this, you know, everybody talks about the wide zone and stuff, and we've run it for 100 years here. But their way of getting to the edge uh, is the toss crack plays, are the toss crack plays. The other night they ran a bunch of what we call ride 38 and 39 club, which is, you know, pull the guard, he blocks the corner, pull backs up inside for the strong safety, down, down, you know, get everybody on the edge. So they scheme the edge probably a lot different to your point than a lot of teams in the league that are more zone oriented to doing it. But it's really whatever the flavor, whatever, whatever you feel like you're best at doing, they have arrived at that point. And for years, you know, the last six or seven years, we've been a fullback, you know, as much as we can, a fullback oriented team that uses that guy as a lead blocker. And we did it so well. James Devlin did it really well, and Jakob's doing a great job of doing it now. So all those things come into play, and sometimes it changes. It gets a little bit different every year, and, and that's okay too. But I think the, the, the playbook is expansive enough and broad enough to give you a, enough flexibility to be whatever it is, maybe a little bit different uh, each year or maybe on even a week-to-week -week basis uh, as the season goes on. So Dante, you mentioned a couple of plays there, and and if you have time, would love to. I'm going to share my screen with you here, and okay. um, because they had a couple of good angles on the TV broadcast the other night, and the second play that you mentioned, the crack toss one, is one that I think a lot of people are probably familiar with, yeah, uh, because it has been kind of a a staple for some time here in New England. But you mentioned another play. And I'm going to play one of those types of plays here where it looks like the play side guard is pulling. Yep. You that'll be down Ted. blocks on the edge. So what was that called? Did you say? That's ride 39 club. And so what's the, I'm just going to play it through here, but what on this play is sort of the key element? Cause this was one that we saw again. And again I and again think the, the biggest other. key element is whether or not the center can get that middle linebacker. Because if you look at it from the beginning, Phil, that guy is 49 is a long way over to the call side. So on when you is going to block the guy on him, the left tackle is going to block down on the defensive tackle. Ted's going to pull and block the corner. The tight end is going to take the Sam linebacker. And then the, uh, the fullback's going to block the next guy and block four. So 
You watch all those guys do that, you'll see the play. So Ted's going to come out there and block the corner. Watch. He's going to the corner. All right, now they have – David was trying to get the middle linebacker, and because he was so far over, Jakob had to get him. So down, now David's got to turn north and look for the safety coming down. Let's see if he does it. No, he, hit, he hits him in the back. Way to go. But that's – that's a play that we've run for a long time. And we don't, we, there's years where we haven't run the play, but they're doing a great job of it now. Well, and then you have big Trent getting down the field on the backside. Backside, backside the cut play. off. Yep. Is that, is that impress you to, to just see a man? I know you obviously spent a lot of time very close with Trent, um, but a man, his size just moving down the field, the way he does. Is, yeah. is pretty he's, rare. He's rare, man. No, he's a giant that, that really, can do a lot of special things. And the the other play that I wanted to show you here was the because it, it went for it went for the touchdown, the big long touchdown. That to me um, looked like a crack toss kind of play. I think it was. Let's take a look. Okay, so I'm going to try to pull it up here. So this is uh, you've got the the very tight split from Nikhil, and it's another two back run, and Michael Wenu is right on the end of the line again, um, but. You know, you mentioned the, the key on the last one you felt like was if that center can get to the middle linebacker. Is there a spot here that you're looking at before the snap that tells you whether or not the play might have a chance? Let's, uh, can you let it run and we'll yeah, sure. let's see if we can get the play? Yeah, they're going to the left. This is really pretty good. They got great angles on this one. So back it up if you can. Sure. So, all right. So on this play, they're going to crack the guy in man on the line of scrimmage with Nikhil. Mm -hmm. So he's got that guy. Then Isaiah's going to pull for the corner outside. All right. And the fullback's going to take the Will linebacker, who is 53. Uh, the guy right there. Yep. Yep. And the center and left guard are going to zone for the middle linebacker. And the right guard and right tackle are going to zone for the backside backer. So the left guard and the center have the mic. Right tackle, right guard have the Sam. The fullback's got the will crack in the end the guard and the tackle has the corner and they, they, and then this, this ball, I think Damien did a great job because he cut this one way back. Let's see how it goes. And he's got to beat that guy. There, there's your entry point. He cuts it underneath all the way back to the inside and the safety overruns it. And they got a big void in the middle because they've done a great job of cutting off the backside. Watch everybody from the left guard all the way back. They got them all. Is it rare to have it that well blocked up? Uh, well, when you do, you probably get a 64 yard touchdown run. <laughs> so, but this is a yes. great job of running now. I'm not kidding you. Great cut see back, that. plant and run like hell. Don't get caught. Is part of the reason they do have some of those angles that you mentioned at the beginning there, Dante, because they have so many people on the right side of the formation here. I mean, the, the extra lineman, the tight end, are the Bills cheating that way, thereby giving Damian some space on, on the other side? I would say two things to you in that regard. They had, the, they had Nikhil so close that these linebackers probably are thinking crack sweep, so they're now more balanced than they were before. Remember the middle linebacker on that previous play was way over to the call side. Well, now he's more at home. So now you really could run the play that they ran before where they pull the guard to the right, you know, and, and, and the fullback goes there and everybody goes that side, as well as now they can run this crack sweep because they can get the Mike linebacker on this one. They could get the Mike linebacker on if they were to run the club play to the right. So they got the best of all the worlds here. And it's a nightmare for the defense because – you know, you're saying, well, cheat it here and cheat it there, and you can't do either. Well, that was great, and, and I learned a ton right there. And, and, Dante, you spent so much time with us, which I really appreciate. I did want to ask you one more question because, you know, sure. we know we know how um, demanding you could be as a coach, and I know I've talked to people like David Andrews who, who loved you for it, um, and we know, you know, how Bill can be as a coach, and he's acknowledged that he can be a hard guy to play for. When the team, and you've been on some really successful teams, obviously, it goes without saying, this team right now is having a lot of success. And, you know, I think we saw a team on Monday night in the Bills that, that has had success and I think is trying to figure out how to deal with success. And the Patriots, as a, as a 
you know, as a team, as a franchise have dealt with it for a long time and, and they have proven that they know how to deal with it. But there are a lot of players, new players on this roster. You know, there's a young quarterback. Will you be watching to see how they handle success now or, or how will the Patriots go about it here? Their first place in the division, first place in the conference to try to maintain that edge that helped them get to this point. I think it, you know, it will start with the head coach and through the, the coaching staff and keep everyone grounded. But as more importantly than that, this team has right now and has for a long time has great leadership in the locker room, great leadership in the locker room. Some of the most amazing players I've been around are in that locker room right now. I'm not going to say any names. I'll let everybody figure it out. But but they won't let these guys get too far ahead of themselves, especially those young guys. They will not let it happen. And the head coach, believe me, he, he'll be the flag bearer and he'll tell them all. And then it's up to the other guys, the other assistants to make sure that within their position group, it's grounded. But the players don't ever sell this group short relative to leadership and the culture in there and all the rest of it. You know, they know what's at stake. They know that they can't, you know, take anything for granted. And they'll work. They're going to go out there and work like crazy every day going forward and try to protect what they have. And right now, you know, they're, they're doing okay. Well, they're definitely doing okay right now. And I know fans here are hoping that continues. And I know, Dante, that they have also enjoyed hearing from you. Thanks so much for spending some time with us here on the Next Pats podcast. We really appreciate it. This has been... Uh educational to say the least i think a lot of the people that that listen to us we try to bring in guests that know something about the game that'll help them understand the game a little bit more deeply and uh, i i'm i'm sure we accomplished that with you today so thank you thanks bill thanks for having me on love that conversation with dante scarnecchia i learned a lot hopefully you did as well so much fun to be able to watch these plays and watch them from the end zone angle and just try to picture yourself being in the offensive line meeting room with Dante Scarnecchia as he's going over these types of things with his group. You can hear it in his voice. He still loves talking about the game, and we were honored that he was able to come on with us and talk some ball. All right, so that's your bye week edition of Next Patch. We'll be back next week ahead of Patriots Colts. Big, big matchup there, a Saturday night matchup for you. But before that, make sure you're keeping an eye out for the Patriots Talk podcast as well. Myself, Tom Curran, Matt Castle, that episode of Patriots Talk is going to be dropping on Thursday. All right, have a great weekend, everybody. We will talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to Next Pats. Please, 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 if you haven't already, rate, comment, subscribe, download, tell your friends, and enjoy the bye. Bye.